Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. And in this video, I will be showing you all of the Cisco commands that we use to build our template to configure our new switches for our switch upgrade project. So I will be showing you what the commands are used for line by line. And keep in mind that in real world production, we don't just configure the host name of the switch. We don't just create VLANs. There is so much more that we do and so much more commands that we use to configure our switches, especially security hardening. We are disabling a lot of features and services that are not in use. So that's why we have to create a template for our switch configuration so that they are ready to go when we are actually setting up the switches. Just to make sure we have all of the switch commands that we use because we don't enter the command one by one when we are actually deploying switches. So if you're interested in today's video, please keep on watching and without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so let's get started with a basic switch configuration. This command sets the name of the switch to EC5 switch. This is for easier identification, of course. And the naming convention depends on your company, but we typically put the location where the switch is physically located. So it'll be easier for us to tell where the switch is just by looking at the name. Next, this is the command that defines the domain name used for the SSH key generation and hostname resolution. So in here, the domain name is eCharmer.com, for example. Then these are the commands to enable SSH access. This generates RSA keys for secure SSH connections. SSH requires a key pair to encrypt sessions. This enables SSH version 2, which is more secure than version 1. And then this command is used for assigning an IP address and subnet mask to the interface. It's typically done under the interface VLAN or the physical interface. We also have this command that applies the access control list named DOS to incoming traffic on this interface to help prevent denial of service attacks. Then these are the commands to disable unnecessary IP services. The no IP redirects prevents the switch from sending ICMP redirect messages. This is more for added security. ICMP redirects can be used maliciously to reroute traffic to an attacker's device. Sometimes attackers can spoof redirects to hijack traffic. Then we also disable the IP route cache. This disables fast switching or the route caching. So fast switching bypasses detailed inspection and it's useful when you want every packet to be checked by the CPU for testing or debugging. Then the no IP proxy ARP prevents the switch or router from replying to ARP requests on behalf of other devices. Without this, a misconfigured device can't accidentally or maliciously reach another subnet without going through a firewall or router. The no IP unreachables stops the device from sending ICMP destination unreachable messages. This is disabled because these messages can reveal the network topology such as what devices or ports are closed. And of course, we have our favorite command, the no shut. Of course, this enables the interface if it's administratively shut down. Next is the configuration to set up the time synchronization. So these commands adds NCP servers to synchronize the switch's clock, and this is very important for logs and time-sensitive operations. Let's now move on to the DNS settings. The no IP name server clears any previous DNS server settings. Then we have this command that specifies a DNS server that is used to resolve the domain names. And of course, it's best practice to add a backup DNS server as well. Another security measure is the banner for login. This command sets a login message. The users will see this warning before logging in. Then we use the caret symbol as a delimiter to enter the message, then another caret symbol to finish the message. Then we have commands to disable WSMA. WSMA is a Cisco feature that allows external management systems to interact with Cisco devices using web-based APIs. This is useful in environments that integrate with management tools, but if unused, it's a potential attack surface. Since we don't use these management tools at work, we are disabling them. 
We prefer using SSH or SNMP over web interfaces because they are more secured and more controlled. Next are more security hardening commands for IP and web services. The no IP source route disables source routing, which is a rarely used feature that can be abused by at attackers to control the path a packet takes through the network. These commands disable the HTTP and HTTPS web-based management interfaces, which are security risk if left exposed and unused. And this command disables HTTP-based local authentication. This is not really needed if you've already disabled the HTTP access. Now we have commands for configuring syslog logging. These commands send log messages to external syslog servers at these IP addresses. And this command sends logs to another syslog server using a custom UDP port. The logging monitor informational command sends logs of informational level and above to users logged into the CLI. The logging trap informational command controls what level of log messages are sent to syslog servers. In this case, informational and more critical are sent. This prevents logs from flooding the console. This is really useful for performance and avoiding distractions. This command stores logs in memory up to this amount of bytes, showing informational messages and higher. This command logs failed login attempts. This helps track brute force or unauthorized access attempts. Next commands are for BTY line configuration or remote access. These commands apply settings to BTY lines 0 to 4 for remote access lines. This disconnects idle sessions after 60 minutes. The login synchronous command is also one of my favorite because it prevents log messages from interrupting the user's current command input on the console or BTY lines. Without it, console messages would be inserted into the middle of a command being typed, making configuration difficult. Only SSH is allowed for incoming and outgoing remote access and no telnet. And this command sets the default gateway for the switch, which allows management traffic to leave the local subnet. Next are the commands for spanning tree and loop protection. This adds the VLAN ID to the bridge ID, which is used by spanning tree protocol. This is required in PVST Plus and Rapid PVST Plus to avoid bridge ID conflicts across VLANs. This enables BPDU guard on all port fast enabled ports. This prevents switches or rogue devices from being plugged into access ports by shutting down the port if it receives BPDUs. This enables loop guard globally. It prevents loops by stopping ports from moving to forwarding state if BPDUs stop unexpectedly. And UDLD enable enables unidirectional link detection to identify and shut down one-way links that can cause network problems, especially in fiber connections. Next are commands for management services. These two commands disable the HTTP and HTTPS servers on the switch to reduce attack surface and follow security best practices. This command enables SCP to allow secure file transfers over SSH. This command starts the link layer discovery protocol, which helps discover directly connected device, even the non-Cisco ones, unlike the CDP, which is Cisco proprietary only. This command sets a description of the device's physical location used by SNMP monitoring tools. And this defines the chassis ID, which is usually the serial number, to uniquely identify the device in SNMP-based systems. And these following commands are for access control list for voice over IP or network control. So these commands are for extended ACLs to allow UDP traffic in specific port ranges used by voice over IP, telepresence, and other real-time communication systems with high priority. Next are commands for AAA. So this command enables AAA framework allowing centralized authentication. 
This command creates a TACAC server group and adds two servers for authentication. This command tries TACAC plus first then falls back to the local enabled password if the server is unreachable. This sets different login authentication methods for various clients and use cases. These allow fallback or mixed login methods. This command controls enable mode access using TACX first, then enable password. And this authorizes CLI commands at privilege levels 0, 1, and 15 using TACX if the user is authenticated. And this enables accounting logs via TACX for executive sessions, level 15 commands, and connection events. This helps with audit and compliance. And the next commands are what we are most familiar with, the VLAN configuration. So these commands create VLANs and assigns descriptive names for organization. Then we have the trunk port configuration. This sets the port to trunk mode, which allows it to carry traffic for multiple VLANs. This adds a comment to the interface configuration and helpful for identifying what the port is connected to. This sets the traffic statistics refresh rate to every 30 seconds and is useful for faster monitoring and troubleshooting. This command tells the switch to log link up and down messages when the port status changes. And this applies a quality of service policy on outbound traffic. This typically handles traffic shaping, prioritization, and more. And last would be the access port configuration. This command applies settings to all the gigabit Ethernet ports 1 to 48 at once. This assigns these ports to VLAN 2 for regular data traffic. And this sets VLAN 500 for voice traffic. This enables voice VLAN tagging for proper quality of service and separation. This command forces these ports into access mode, meaning they only allow one VLAN. And this command disables log messages when link status changes. This is typically done to reduce log noise. And this stops SNMP traps from being sent when the port link status changes. And this is, again, to reduce unnecessary alerts. And this last command is to enable port fast, which allows the port to skip STP learning and listening phases and go directly to forwarding. This is ideal for ports connected to end devices like computers and phones. Okay, so that's our switch configuration template. If you want to see how we set up and configure our switch in the workplace, please stay tuned for the next videos. Thank you so much for watching and see you guys in the next video.